Welcome to Far East Wargaming, bringing you another Heresy Thursday. I'm your host, Richard, and once again, joining me is Jason. Hello, everyone. So, for this week's Heresy Thursday, we wanted to go over the latest exciting announcement by Games Workshop, and that is the new plastic Solo Auxilia kits. Yeah, this was the recent drop that they had teased at the LVO. It was probably the worst tease ever because all the artwork and graphics leading up to the actual announcement pretty much pointed at Solar Ox, but we have the Solar Auxilia battle group that's dropping on us. Yes, and honestly, I'll start off with just my initial impressions. The models look amazing, and it's great to finally get these guys in plastic, and I think they do justice to the original Forge World models and have kept quite a lot of the similarities. They didn't change too much whilst shifting into plastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even though we're starting off with the battle group box, they did tease or show pictures for a lot of other models that are coming for the Solar Ox. But we're going to kind of start with this one. Um, it follows in the same pattern as the battle group that we got for the Mark Threes when they dropped with the, the Derrideo and the Land Raider. So I think this is a very, very nice little set for you Solar Ox players, but it does have some downsides. But as far as visually, I mean, I said this in my Instagram, they really crushed it on the Solar Ox. These models look so good. No, they do look amazing. And I'm excited to get my hands on these guys and try a bit of painting because the level of detail on them uh, is really nice. It's nice to see something other than a marine in plastic for us. And i just I'm, I'm still shocked at the level of detail they're getting out of their latest models here and especially the latest versions of their tanks and well a also a new walker but i think i'm jumping ahead of myself there no i think it's fair i mean we can talk about a lot of different things about this set i mean as far as detail goes on these it's actually if you compare it to the forge world models it is a slight change um so the forge world models tended to have like this kind of quilted under armor ribbed armor like kind of it, it, the, the styling is slightly different is what i'm basically trying to say um but i actually kind of prefer these in some ways and i think they're going to be faster to paint up than the forge world models as well because they don't have as much texture on them there's a lot of flat surfaces uh this is one of those kinds of sets that you could spray whatever your under under armor coverall is going to be like for example a gray color or a khaki color whatever else and then come in and paint details or you could go the opposite of spraying these with lead belcher and then go in and paint details um, I agree with you. They're getting some really, really nice sculpts out of these, the new technologies, and they're great-looking models. I, I do like these infantry a lot. Well, so let's do a quick breakdown of what is in the box. So the box is comprised of a five-man uh, line command squad as well as 20 rifle section models that can be divided into two 10 man or what i think most people would do because it's solar orcs run this as a single 20 man strong rifle section they've also included a dracosan armored transport there so now this is in plastic whereas in the past this used to be a very big resin model and a lehman russ strike tank as well as their new walker that we saw in the Legions Imperialis, the Aethon Heavy Sentinel. We now have this in full scale, but no rules or pricing for that model. Correct, as well as no pricing disclosed for the box set itself. But if we go off of the, the Mark III battle group, it's somewhere in the range of probably about 150 pounds, 200 US, you know, it's about 800 ringgit here in Malaysia. Um, there's an unfortunate aspect to this. And I, since we're talking about pricing, let's just go ahead and get into this part of the discussion. You're going to need three boxes of this just to make the core of your solar ox, folks. <laughs> oh, um, for those that thought going to plastic solar ox was going to be a massive savings, it is probably going to be some sort of savings when it's all said and done versus Ford World Resin. Um, but this is around a 600 to 700 point box. And just to fill out, you know, some troops and stuff, you're going to need three boxes of this, and you're going to wind up with 60 riflemen, three command sections, three Athons, three Lehman Russ, and three Dracosons, which is not a bad start to the core of your army. But that's only going to be topping out at somewhere between 1,800 to 2,000 points, which means you've still got a lot of other stuff you need to buy. 
Yeah, that is the big elephant in the room because their points values are so low. You're right, it is around 600 to 700 fully kitted out uh, here. And there's actually, though there's, the models are lovely, and I'm glad they're in here, there's some inefficiencies in the way they formatted this. And, well, that mainly to me comes down to the actual armored transport, the Dracosan there. It's a very expensive point model that does relatively little for this initial force. Now, I think it'll be great when we have some uh, Velastaris, uh, Velataris storm sections that could probably go into this. But for a rifle section, you want them on the board. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I mean, again, it just depends on how you're planning on running your army. Um, I mean, at its base, it carries 20 troopers. And of course, if you decide to switch out the dual Gravis Laz cannon for the demolishing cannon, then it cuts it in half. I don't necessarily think that's the right play with this particular model because, um, let's face it, demolisher cannons just aren't that great in 2.0. They, they don't have the marine killing firepower that they used to have. Um, I mean, I guess, yes, if you're going to use this in a small 10-man squad like your Velatar storm section or something like that. Yeah, I could see perhaps going that route, but I think in most cases you probably want the LAS cannons. Um, as far as the Dracosan model itself, I mean, that one was a beautiful model when forge world made it so seeing this in plastic from that perspective from a modeling a hobbyist perspective uh it's great i love this thing but you're absolutely right i mean game wise they're not that good they're just not that great um but even your rifle sections they're so cheap you know maybe sticking one or two of them in in these things to go snag some objectives or to go you know just be a distraction or whatever else i mean i can still see a use for it then rather than just having all your guys on the table, because let's face it, there's so much AP4 weaponry that the, the legions have access to, the Mechanicum have access to, you're going to be losing your guys in droves. Uh, so any additional protection, such as like we give rhinos uh, or Dracosans, I think would be appreciated. Yeah, uh, look, I don't disagree in their vulnerability. There is another dedicated transport, the Aurox transport, which is basically a rhino. Uh, that fits 10 men that I think would have been better suited in this box set. Uh, maybe even two of them because it's considerably smaller than the size of the Dracosan. I think the Dracosan looks to be scaled somewhere Land Raider or maybe even Spartan size, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, it's definitely bigger. It looks bigger just from the pictures. Um, you know, some of you probably have the Dracosan that you could compare to a Lehman Russ Forest. If you do put it into the comments, I've never actually put the two of them next to each other other than seeing them in display cases and things like this. Uh, yeah, it does look to be a little bit bigger than your Rhino for sure. Uh, and of course, the picture itself that you see on the article for, for Warhammer Community makes it seem like it is bigger than the Lehman Russ. So yeah, interested to hear people's feedback that have put the two next next to each other. But as far as the model goes, I mean, it's it's an excellent model. I like the detailing. I like the kind of you know, kind of steampunk vibe that it has with all the extra metallic trim. Um, same type of styling, actually, that they're putting on other models across the range, which, which is the Athon or this new Lehman Russ. No, I do like the trim, and we were given kind of a preview of what that was going to look like from the Legion Imperialis models. Even at that scale, I've been painting the tanks, and it's been very, very tempting for me to try and pick out all of that detail. I've uh, abstained from doing that to drive, not drive me insane, uh, <laughs> painting uh, all the detail on these tiny tanks. But if I had these ones in person, I'd be picking out every single rivet. <laughs> Yes, agree. And I mean, you can go that route uh, if you want, of course. I'm spending extra time on vehicles is always good. But your infantry, let's face it, you're going to probably have to paint about 120 to 200 of these bad boys. Uh, picking out every single detail may not make sense. Um, but again, that being said, kind of coming back to the infantry, we get some differences, obviously, not and only with the aesthetic, with the armor slightly changing. Uh, but we get new, like, for example, the Vox equipment, the Vexilla is tweaked a bit. The Sergeant's loadout, you know, with the access to the weapons that he has and the way they're styled and designed, all that is new. And then, of course, the Command Squad looks really good. Probably, I'd say, my favorite model in the entire Command Squad has got to be that, that standard bearer. It's just a really good-looking way they've sculpted that with the banners kind of hanging down, and he's holding them in his hand. 
Uh, of course, he's armed with a Thord, which is probably a waste of points on Solar Ox, but maybe you can give him something else. Uh, but that command squad looks really good as well. I like the styling on most of these models. No, they, they've done really well. And the close-ups we've seen on the Warcom site have shown how, if you want to go to crazy levels of detail, heavy metal scale style, you can get some fantastic effects on these. Like I said, can't speak enough about how lovely these models are and how glad we're to have them in plastic. It comes down to how you get to feel this and how much it will get to feel. And that's to me is the biggest downside of this box just because of the scale of numbers you need, the hordeness of a solar orcs army. I was hoping, and I'm still hoping, that they're going to price it more reasonably for the number of models you have to field. So pricing it as to their points value as opposed to trying to standardize it, making this 20-man rifle section the same cost as a 20-man uh, mer tactical marine squad uh, in Mark VI or Mark III at the moment. Um, but I've got a feeling we'll see nearly exact same pricing for those two boxes. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, unfortunately, it wouldn't. But, I mean, again, if you bought the Mark III Battle Force or the starter box, I mean, you're getting a lot of value out of those versus buying these things separately. So if I'm a Solar Ox player, I'm definitely buying this box in multiples. And I do plan on us buying this box in multiples for the channel. Um, you know, whether or not you use all the Lehman Russ or whether you not, not use all the other armored pieces is debatable because I've seen some pretty nasty lists that are incredibly infantry heavy. And I've also seen some pretty nasty lists, including one game that was played recently here by some friends that, that a full armored solar ox list can do some work. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, cost you're looking still to honestly make a solar ox army. If you took three of these box sets and let's assume that you bought another 150 pounds worth of the other box sets that you would want to fill this out. Storm sections, uh, the Charonite Ogrins, uh, more armor, you know, weapons teams, whatever. Let's just assume that you put another 150 pounds into this thing. You're looking at 600 pounds to probably do 3,000 points of Solar Ox. And it's not a flexible 3,000 points. It's going to be nearly the same list every single time um is that cheaper than having gone the forge world route before debatable i mean people people were able to buy lehman russ's second hand pretty cheaply i mean i i have probably five or six of them sitting in a box around here somewhere that were just people's unwanted tanks from 40k um it's still going to cost you a pretty penny to make this army unfortunately yep that is the unfortunate truth of this but in terms of models, you did talk about some. They actually previewed more than they're releasing right now in this box set. So they did preview the Velotaris Storm section in plastic there with the uh, Volkite calibers. Again, to me, the sculpts look great. Uh, they've done a fantastic job of these. And this comes in a 10-man box, it looks like. So again... Don't know the pricing of this because we don't currently have 10-man boxes for the Horus Heresy. Yeah, uh, they did preview the Volkite option. They didn't preview the Axe, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, but we have the Forge World Axe versions to go off of. Uh, I do like these. Um, I would have liked to have seen maybe something done a little bit differently with the, the weaponry. Um, I don't know, make it even more steampunk looking. Uh, I do like the little targeter scanner that's on the shoulder. I think that's a nice touch kind of to differentiate them from the rifle section. Um, I would have liked to see the axes, but I agree with you. They're good looking models, a lot to like on these. Um, and the axes, for those of you that were probably Solar Ox players in 1.0 or played against them, were a pretty popular choice when going against Marines because it was just a, a mountain of, uh, of AP2 attacks that you could unleash on people. Obviously, your guys are not going to stick around and, and just be Death Stars or something like that, but at least you had a viable option to counter charge or charge into, into Legion players. Um, but overall, yeah, I like these models as well. And they also uh, released a preview of what the upgrade for the Lehman Russ is, the Assault version, because the version, the Strike version you get in the box comes with the Laz Cannons, the 
uh, Vanquisher Cannon, the Battle Cannon, and I think uh, the Auto Cannon, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, Gra Gravis Auto Cannon. But the Lehman Russ Assault Tank upgrades the weapons, giving you access to the Demolisher Cannon, a Volkite uh, Macro Saker, and also a... Uh, what does that look like, actually? It's... Um, it looks like a plasma of some sort, but I can't. I could. I can't really tell. Yeah, it's definitely plasma. So that's going to be a executioner plasma cannon, which is also an option that you can take in 40k. Um, it, it's debatable which which weapon is best. And again, I'm not a solar ox player, so don't quote me on on tactics or anything like this. But if I'm running the Lehman Russ, I'm probably running it with a Vanquisher cannon to reach out and touch people. Well, I'm probably running it with Gravis Laz Cannon. I'm definitely not running it with the Demolisher. I'm definitely not running it with the Volkite. Uh, I mean, yes, eight Volkite shots is pretty nasty. But again, most lists have stuff to deal with infantry. So in general, you want your vehicles dealing with other vehicles or heavily armed targets. Um, to me, the Plasma Cannon is probably a good choice as well, right? You know, pie plates that always get, uh, get rending options or, excuse me, or breaching options are, are always good. Um, pencil Weapons. I mean, depending, again, on how they're pointed and how the rest of your army is constructed, I mean, I can definitely see a choice for the, the, the pencil weapon option. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I just love the way this, they've styled this tank. You know, one thing that I also want to call out is if you look at those little things on the back that kind of look like the little ramps that are sticking out from the back of the Lehman Russ, that's a nice little throwback to uh, World War One tanks that uh, use these to actually cross the trenches uh, so they didn't get stuck in the trench. That's what those things are actually for on the back. Nice styling on the on the bulldozer blade. Um, a little bit of styling differences around the front, around the gun mantlet. Uh, yeah, it's a great model. It's a really, really great model, and I like what they've done with this. That's a cool little point uh, about history there. I, I thought they were uh, compensators for rocking after you fired <laughs> fired the tank cannon. Uh, but yeah, if uh, if they're actually for crossing trenches, it's a, it's a very nice little addition. They've had them, again, we've seen them in the... Malkador and the Lehman Russ of the Legions Imperialis. So it's nice to see they've kept that across the range as they've scaled up there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think let's let's face it, the, the original Lehman Russ model was showing its age, right? It's it, it's always been a cool design, but the the design aesthetic and the look of it is obviously 20, 30 years old, whatever the age of it is now. I can't remember exactly. So the way that they've done this one up to not just only match the Solar Ox design theme, but also just to kind of just improve the overall look of the tank, I think it's a I think it's a hit. Um, they did say that they're not going to release rules for these for 40k, so no taking the 30k weapon options and playing them in 40k. But nobody's going to stop you from playing an existing 40k option with this tank, so it has dual purpose for that that as well, um, which is always useful. The one thing we haven't seen is the rest of the range, but I'm sure we'll be getting that in plastic as well, or at least I hope so. So the Ogrins and such would be lovely to, to get in plastic because I think they're quite a fundamental part of a Solar Orcs army. And um, again, we've seen the models previewed in tiny scale, epic scale. Uh, I think it's only a matter of time before we get them in the plastic scale, full, uh, well, full playing scale that we we use here yeah so the other tank that was previewed at lvo is also the new malkador in plastic uh this was another forge world model that's now made his way over to uh to the more friendly material and it looks ace i mean from a, a aesthetic perspective it continues the trim and, and the design cues that we're seeing from the rest of the range uh you've got the new redesigned dozer blade on the front and you've got some little tweaks here and there to the, the forge world model um, I love this thing. It looks fantastic. It's definitely debatable whether it's any good in 2.0. Uh, they used to be pretty nasty in 1.0, and then they got toned down quite a bit. But as a heavy support choice, I mean, you could do worse, uh, but I love the model. No, the model does look great. But as you alluded, tanks aren't in a great place in this latest edition of Horus Heresy here. And its durability itself isn't that great for the points i think it's around 225 points and it only comes with as standard 13 front and sides 12 in the rear so not anywhere near what a land raider would be or some of the other tanks but closer to a predator 
Yeah, you're right. Um, probably the difference is this is going to have a bit more firepower than a Predator uh, and even potentially more than a Land Raider, right? Because I think you can stick as many, if I'm not mistaken, as four or five LAS cannons on this thing if you so desired between the hull, the sides, and the main turret. Um, you do have a lot of weapon options and a lot of versatility if you want to go that route for the side and the hull weapons and the turret. If for some reason you wanted to, to take a demolisher, you could. I don't recommend it for the same reasons we talked about the Lehman Ruffs. Uh, if you wanted to just play you know, fun and put nothing but a bunch of heavy flamers on this thing, you can eat it up into the enemy and, and have a good time that way. Uh, but similar to the Lehman Ruffs, I tend to believe that the best loadout for it is the Vanquisher Cannon, um, the Laz Cannon Sponsons. You don't really need a lot of anti-infantry in most of your lists, whether it's Solar Ox or Legion, because... Let's face it, there's just so many weapons out there that can kill infantry quite well. So for the Solar Ox in particular, you're going to need a way to deal with, uh, you know, the Legion of Starkey's tanks and Terminators and things like this. And that's why I tend to lean towards the last cannons, which are just so good in this edition. Yep, the last cannons, I think, have found a key role being multifunctional. They're great against vehicles with their Sunder, and their AP2 and strength is instant deathing a lot of those two wound artificer or terminator armor models there. It's uh, definitely loading these up. And you can have three in a squadron, which would be nice. So, like I said, this looks around the same size as the Dracosin um, armored transport. Might have been nice to have one of these instead, because then three boxes of the battle group would have been a full squadron of Malkador heavy tanks, a full squadron of Lehman Russes, and then a lot of infantry there. Yeah, very fair point. Might have been a better play. Um, but again, I, I mean, it's, it's all about how you want to construct your list. If you want to go armored with Solar Ox, obviously, that's very viable. If you want to go infantry heavy, that's viable as well. And if you want to go mixed arms approach, that's viable too, which is one of the, the beauties of this list. Um, yeah, it's also what are the price points between the two. So Games Workshop could have made a, a budget decision to put the Dracus on and not the Malkador if the two of them have a higher price or if the Malkador has a higher price on the shelf. Um, so yeah, we'll see because we don't know what the price point on this is going to be. Um, we don't honestly know the price point for a lot of the Solar Ox just yet. We're, we're just making our own estimates based on the Mark III Battle Force. Um, but one thing I'd also like to come back to, because we kind of glossed over it very quickly, is that Aethon Heavy Sentinel, right? We don't know the rules for this thing yet, so we can only guess. Uh, I like the design. It obviously has similarities with, with regular Sentinels, but then it also has the extra trim and the steampunk vibe that we're seeing in the range. The weapons, right? It says it's a heavy barrage-capable rocket system. Okay, does that mean it fires like a Spicula launcher on a Saber? Or excuse me, not, not a Saber, what was the other one called? Uh, the other little tank that kind of looks like a Saber, but uh, anyhow, not important. Bombard, the Arquiter. Well, yeah, the Arquiter, excuse me. Does it fire like that? Does it fire a ripple of crack or frag missiles? Is it an actual barrage weapon? I don't know, right? And if it is barrage weapon, you, don't, you typically don't want your barrage weapons where people can see them. You want them shooting indirectly, which is a kind of weird combination if you're going to stick a lab cannon on the thing or, you know, the melt lance or whatever. So we'll have to see what those rules look like. Um, it does look like it has also the option to switch that barrage launcher for hunter killers. Um, I'm kind of torn on this just based on the, the pictured loadout from a tactics perspective. Why you'd stick a heavy flamer on this with a long-range missile launcher is unknown to me. Unless, of course, those are very short-range missiles or something like this. So that's a loadout that I don't understand. Volkite, again, you've got so many things that can deal with infantry. Why do you need Volkite? So I find myself continuously coming back from a purely tactics perspective. Laz cannon, melt and lance, probably the weaponry I would be looking at here. And then again, it depends on, on how those missiles work. But this is a bit of a weird one, I think. I mean, I, I like the fact that it's a new addition to the range, but just based on what we're seeing here, it's it's kind of weird to me where this kind of fits into your list. Yeah, I think it comes with a multi-laser as standard there and uh, then a few other guns. Again, it looks like the kind of thing you want to be kiting because also it doesn't look like there's any close combat ability at all. So it's not something you'd be charging against dreadnoughts. <laughs> it's something that you'd be kiting from from distance. Uh, we'd have to we'd have to see. I'm guessing this is going to come under a walker 
like a Dreadnought or Leviathan is. But without seeing the rules, it's very hard to judge. Yes, and if it is, if it does have a profile like a Walker, now that opens up an entirely different ball game, right? Because let's face it, Contemptors are just really hard to kill. So if this thing has a similar profile to a Walker versus a vehicle, then I could definitely see more of a use for it because you're going to get more durability out of the firing platform. But yeah, it remains to be seen. And as far as points goes, when we were doing our estimates on what the Battle Force looks like, we were kind of pointing this around 100, uh, 100 to the 150 range, depending on uh, on the base as well as the weapon upgrades. But yeah, we'll see. Well, look, that's everything for the new Plastic Solar Auxilia. We'll be bringing you updates on the Solar Auxilia as they come out, and we are hearing them from Warcom. But there were a couple of other things we wanted to talk about this week, and one of them was the announced upgrade kit for the Blood Angels. Yes, we have another upgrade kit that's Legion-specific. So this one gives access for Blood Angels players to the the various Perdition weapons, so Spear of Perdition, Blade of Perdition, Mace of Perdition, Axe of Perdition. You can see those in the kit. Uh, you also have a couple of the Inferno pistols, the little handheld Melta cannons. Um, these only got a blood drop on the bottom of it, so meh. I mean, that wasn't exactly a weapon option that Blood Angels players were screaming for because you could get easily get those from uh, 40k plastic kits. Um, you do have a, a Blood Angel specific assault cannon, the Lastius Pattern assault cannon. I do like that. It'll be good for jazzing up your, your squad sergeant or something like this. The weird one to me is actually the bolters. And and here's the reason why they're weird. Um, you don't necessarily have all the, uh, the arm options here, right? Because Mark VI kits and Mark III kits, the hand... The left hand is molded onto the body of the gun. These don't have that. Uh, you have only one that has that kind of molded on, but then there's no hand on the firing grip. So these are really weird. They won't just plug and play into your Mark VI or your Mark III or your Mark III models. Uh, you're gonna have to have like kind of a, a straight arm, like for an assault marine, to use this, or one of the straight arms that is in the kit that you're not using on your perdition weapons for some reason. Uh, that one's really weird to me. I do like the design in terms of the little art on it and stuff like that. But the fact that these are not plug and play compatible for at least one or two of the guns doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, it's also in resin. Uh, that's that's another part. Again, I'm not a huge fan of all these upgrade kits being in resin, but it is what it is, and it's nice to have. They also announced, uh, just moving on a tiny bit, the upgrade kits for the vehicles there. Um, so there's the Predator with the double Elastis Assault Cannon. So now we have an upgrade for the Plastic Predators. We do, yeah, we have that. Um, I like it for the turret, and I like it for the pencil mount. Um, but we already had a pencil mount, Elastius of Cannon, with that new vehicle character for the, excuse me, Imperial Fists. Um, but it's nice to get this as a Blood Angels player. The only thing that doesn't make any sense on this upgrade is... Most of the time, Blood Angels players are going full Assault Cannon if they're going to do this on their Preds, right? They're going to replace the turret. They're going to replace the Sponsons. It's kind of strange to me that there's no Sponson option here. Uh, I would have rather have actually had that rather than the Pencil Mount. And if you're buying this for the Pencil Mount just to put it on your Rhino, then that means your Predator is going to suffer because you're not going to upgrade as many of them as you can. So this is another strange choice of weaponry combinations to me. Although all of it is useful, none of it is really complete. Yeah, I think, um, again, nice to get something for the Blood Angels, but doesn't feel thought out there uh, in, in any way, especially, what, as you pointed out, the bolters uh, themselves. Uh, these axes and the Perdition weapons are nice to see, but there's been ways to make these from converting 40k or just doing a bit of green stuffing on what we have available there to meet the needs of this nice to have like missing parts is it? i think i think you're right yeah for both sets probably one other point that i'll make uh that some people may not have actually caught this if you actually look at the arms next to the inferno pistols those are mark four elbows those aren't mark six with the the mark six has the circle 
and they even used that design aesthetic kind of on the uh, uh, on the Mark III a bit. Those are those are definitely Mark IV arms. So what that kind of confirms in my mind is what we've known all along, which is eventually Mark IV plastics are going to come. And if we're on the, I mean, if we're on the topic, all the hints are there that we're getting the full infantry range in plastic, right? You've got Mark II bits on the vehicle accessory sprue, a lot of them, torso, head, arms. You've got, of course, the Mark III, Mark VI kits, which are already out. You've got these indication of Mark IV arms in the slightly bigger scale. I can't recall having seen any other pictures of Mark IV in the new scale or new design. So this is probably the first indication there. We've got the Alpha Legion character and the Apothecary in Mark V, which is a new design. So, I mean, cheer up, Heresy fans. It looks like uh, all the breadcrumbs are there that we're going to have two through six in plastic at some point uh, because we keep getting little clues. Well, I hope you're right, especially for Mark V, because it's a mark that I really want to see for the Horus Heresy range, and I really want to own it, them in plastic. But they have only been released in resin, so it does mean the sculpt is probably available, the digital sculpt to make into plastic. It's whether they go into production or when they go into production there. And as we're all aware, GW has been having some production and manufacturing and shipping issues, especially to us out in Asia, but it has affected the rest of the world. So it's anybody's guess as to when they would be announced, let alone released. Yep, we will see. Hopefully that's all going to happen in 2015 in terms of the other plastic kits. But uh, yeah, you never know because with the release of the old world and all the other things that they've got going on uh, and the way that they've had a pattern of delays for the heresy since 2.0 dropped, I won't get my hopes up that it's in 2015, but I would love to see those twos and fives in plastic. Can't wait. So the last thing I wanted to discuss on today's Heresy Thursday podcast is well, actually to give kudos to Games Workshop and it's in regards to the recent sale of the end of death volume three the special edition hardback which was signed by dan abnett they released that i think it was a week ago and there was a lot of complaints by the community due to the prevalence of scalpers and resellers on the secondary market and this is the first time I felt that Games Workshop has taken this seriously by actively cancelling multiple orders and having a re-release. Um, well, by the time we release this episode, it would have been uh, yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I give them kudos and props as well. But at the same time, I also come back and ask myself if it's not a self-made problem, right? I mean, let's face it, any retailer would love to consistently be stocked out. Any retailer would love to consistency or brand to consistently create hype around their product and desirability. I mean, those are just, I mean, that's marketing 101, right? That's what you would want to do. I personally believe that Games Workshop overall has good customer service. It's debatable about rules and things like that, but I'm talking about the way they back their product the way that you can return Forge World stuff, this kind of thing. That's good customer service, and let's give them credit for that, right? Um, I personally believe that if there hadn't been so much outcry from the community about the book and the scalpers, that they would not have actually done this. I personally believe that, right? Because there's been a lot of outcry about the other limited edition books. There's been outcry about things like, you know, the lion and plastic, you know, all these other things that have been short, just nonstop. They didn't put anything in place to stop scalpers on those. They didn't put anything in place to stop people from buying five or six of those boxes of models and then reselling them for extortionate prices on eBay. Um, I don't think they would have done that for this book either. But so many people were ticked off. And the fact that the scalpers were going online and bragging about it and basically just throwing it in people's face and everything else. I mean, Games Workshop, again, I give them kudos for doing it. I question whether they would have done it if those things didn't happen. I think that's a fair comment to say. And from my personal point of view, to me, this seems, and I, I, quite, I don't quite understand how it's even possible, but this seems like a very 
simple thing to avoid by not allowing purchases, multiple purchases by the same credit card, the same name, or the same shipping address. And that's a very, to me, very simple fix. And I don't think it's too hard to do because other companies do it all the time uh, using those very same safeguards there. And I know, we discussed this prior to the podcast, that they have in they have invested in this queuing system as a means to potentially tackle these uh, scalpers on launch days but clearly it doesn't work and so it's a flawed system there it's just like I think you said it right it's uh, self-fulfilling they've allowed it to happen for so long and their previous countermeasures have been lackluster to say the least that I'm just happy that they're taking it seriously. And I think you've got a fair point about the fact that they might not have if we hadn't caused any ruckus. But this is actually one of the few times where I've felt that GW has listened proactively to an immediate problem as opposed to going, oh, well, next time we'll we'll do it better. Yeah, I agree. You know, and again, I give them props. But, you know, as we always do on this channel, we, we try to give a very unbiased take we try to give a take also as us as consumers and whatnot um just again while we're on the subject you know i am a procurement and supply chain guy by by career by by field this is what i do it's something i've done for 25 years right there's tools out there to actually do your proper planning right like you want to plan your production you based on what you think you're going to sell you can look at historical sales of similar products. You can use AI tools. There's a lot of different ways that you can actually figure out what is your demand on a product and produce enough of the thing, even a quote unquote limited edition format. Like for example, for this book right here, at launch, I would have given people the option to either get the signed copy of which is only 2,500, or I would have been given people the option to do a regular copy, which is unsigned and obviously have much more of that. 5,000, 7,500. I don't know what the historical sales data is on the other limited editions in the, the Siege of Terra series. I have no idea. But, I mean, just looking at it from the exterior, you could have handled this a little bit differently. And all of your product, your planning process, to me, is broken. Like, for, for basic items to be consistently out of stock, yes, there's supply chain issues with the new systems and legacy systems and all this kind of stuff. I get all of that. But invest in more planning, right? You know, hold marketing accountable for, you know, realistic business cases on the products that you're going to launch. You know, there has to be more robust process and system in the back end and in the planning phase to avoid this kind of stuff. And then the system system issues that are well known and everything else are just adding on to that problem. Um, if, if I was the CEO and, you know, I'm not and I don't claim to be as smart as a CEO or anything like that, but I would be looking to the Amazons of the world, the, uh, the Walmarts of the world, the people that are incredibly good at efficiency. And I would be demanding that out of this company as well, right? Because there is so much unfulfilled demand, so much. The secondary market and the scalpers is, is, is all the evidence you need that the company is not properly planning and executing their product launches for whatever reason. So I know I kind of went on a little bit of a rant here, but it's something that drives me nuts that we can't get access to not just limited edition stuff like this for whatever reason, including, you know, not, not planning against scalping and all that, but that we can't get consistent access to the stuff that we need, right? That's unfulfilled demand. That's lost sales. Potentially that's customer dissatisfaction. Um, there needs to be more focus on that. Yep. For us, the most recent, and I think, uh, immediate example of that is the release of legions imperialis a brand new game system in a brand new scale or, or root yeah it's like a brand new scale uh, it's still the same scale as the adeptus titanicus but it's great to release the armies for this but not make available anything to play on um that there is crippling us at far east wargaming we don't have access to the terrain to be able to bring you a viable battle report there. And it's still not available. 
Correct. Or even the individual unit boxes that have been released all over the world but haven't made their way here in, in significant numbers. It's so bad here in Malaysia for Legions Imperialis, with the exception of the starter box. You can still get the starter box. There are stores that obviously have stock of this independent as well as the Warhammer, Thorier, and Kale. But the demand on the other stuff, I mean, you've already talked about the terrain, so I won't talk about that. I'll tell a quick story. I was in the Warhammer store, and I happened to see that they had one box, one box of the Baneblade chassis models. Just one. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I should pick that up for the channel. I was literally 15 minutes too late. Somebody else walked into the store, saw it, immediately grabbed it. Um, another day I was in the Warhammer store, and there was two boxes of the Legion of the Imperial with Rhinos on the shelf. I put a message out into all the social media groups telling people, hey, if you're looking for this, there's two here. People were literally driving from around the city to try and come and grab these things. So those are the problems we have in this part of the world, right? You know, imagine where the demand is even higher in the U.S. or in North America or in Australia or in any of these other places, continental Europe. Um, so much lost opportunity, so much. And people will only wait so long right like unless you're a dedicated leads in the period player you're not going to to wait around six months nine months 12 months to get what you need to play something besides the basics of the starter box that gets boring it gets old um and by that point gw may have actually lost the sales and then all of a sudden at some point we're saying well we're going to stop supporting li because it's not selling well enough you made the problem yourself I'm sorry, I'm ranting a lot, but this just drives me nuts. I mean, it drives me nuts from a professional perspective because this is the kind of stuff I deal with every single day in my job. Uh, but it also drives me nuts as a consumer and it drives me nuts on behalf of the channel because we're so diehard about this. You know, we love the product. We're not fanboys, but we 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 were so excited about Legion Imperialis and here we are however many weeks, months after launch and we still can't even host a game. Look, they're all valid points. Um, I'd like to round up by saying, well, look, well done, Games Workshop, on what you have done well. You aren't a perfect company. Um, nobody expects you to be. And we're giving what we hope is honestly constructive criticism and not just because we're trying to give you potential solutions as well. If anybody from Games Workshop is listening, or one of our few viewers is a Games Workshop member, um, look, please take that to heart because we are here at Far East Wargaming because we love the product range that is being provided by Games Workshop and we support that product range. It just feels that sometimes, maybe maybe mainly because we're in Asia, we aren't supported in return. Yep, rant off. I think all, I mean, point is well made, horse is dead and well beaten. Um, but yeah. I'm excited about what, what the future brings in terms of the other content that we want to want to have on the channel, and hopefully we can solve these headaches and get, get back to that. Well, look, I think that's a good place to round off this week's Heresy Thursday. For those who have stayed with us through the entire show, thank you very much. For those of you who are new or aren't already subscribed, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and that bell notification icon so you get notified of our latest videos. We try to release two a week, a Thursday Heresy podcast and also a battle report or something on a Monday. So if you're not subscribed, you won't get notified. But look, we're really happy to bring this and thanks for staying tuned for so long. Absolutely. Like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, do all of that stuff. It really, really helps us. It really, really motivates us. And again, yeah, thank you for all the support. And we will definitely catch you on the next one.